Well, as uh, Pastor James said, I am the uh, campus pastor for our Adairsville campus. I like to uh, refer to that as Cross Point North. And so uh, up in our Adairsville community, uh, we absolutely love it up there. And I want to give a big shout out to our Adairsville folks that are watching live right now. Cartersville, let's give it up for our Adairsville folks up there. I love it. You get to see me live on stage. They get to watch CS via a live stream. And so I told some of the guys up there, I said, you know, they always say that the camera puts about 10 pounds on you. And I'm thinking, I'd like to have 10 pounds in the right places, maybe some larger biceps or something, <laughs> thicker neck, you know, something of that nature. And so, uh, but uh, just on that note, we miss Pastor James. <laughs> <And> so, <laughs> But I'm glad that you guys are joining us this morning and um, just wonderful thing about uh, being up in Adairsville, it's just such a, a hometown uh, area. We love the folks uh, that are there and uh, God has called us to that ministry and uh, you just wouldn't believe the incredible support of the staff here, uh, support of our community uh, there in Adairsville and so we're so excited. There's just uh, not a time <clears throat> that I drive past the city limit sign in Adairsville and I don't ask Jesus for the city. I ask him for the city. Now, I, I, I just believe, and maybe I'm simple-minded enough just to believe that we serve a God that wants to save people. Amen. I, I are one, right? I mean, I am one of those people that God reached out and rescued from hell, as that song says, I'm one of those, and I rejoice in the fact that I've been rescued from hell. And guess what? I want other people to be rescued as well. And so we're praying for the city. Now, we're continuing in the series today from Hebrews chapter 2. So if you've got a device or you've got uh, your Bible, it will be on the screen, so don't think we're going to leave you out. Uh, but we're going to share some scripture there from Hebrews chapter 2, continuing uh, in this series uh, called Greater Than. And so I'm excited about getting through this. If you've got your manual, if you've got your uh, study uh, manual with you, can you hold that up? Just kind of fan that around a bit. Awesome. Love to see that across here. The wonderful thing about that, if you stay consistent and every single week you take your notes, uh, you write down some personal reflection items, maybe some action items uh, that you want to take. The wonderful thing about it, you can pull that off the shelf two years from now and you can open that up and reflect where God had you right now. And the cool thing about that is, is you get to see what God has done since that time until now, right? Isn't that a wonderful thing? I've got journals that are 20 and 30 years old, prayer journals and the notes that I've taken. And I can look back over those times and I look at what I was struggling with then. And I realize how far God has brought me from those times. It's always good to remember. And to kind of give you a little bit of insight into me and a little bit of my past, uh, I've been a pastor uh, for a long time, as Pastor James said. But about four years ago, we were at a church up in uh, Fort Oglethorpe and serving up there faithfully. But after many, many years of serving in ministry, I got to a place where I was so dry on the inside. I was absolutely burned out as a pastor. And people that know me and know my energy level, and, and, and I mean, my wife will tell you, I twitch at night. I jerk in my sleep. It used to scare her to death, but she's kind of used to it by now. She's, you know, lays in the bed with a, ne a neurotic man that jerks in his sleep, you know, because he has a lot of energy. Uh, but with all that energy trying to pour in to the ministry, man, I just died on the inside. I mean, I just got to a place where I couldn't feel it anymore. I got to a place where preaching, I mean, I just downloaded an outline. and was just going through the motions on a weekly basis until I got to the point where I was so dry. I said, guys, I just can't take the, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it. So we stepped away, but I was so hungry for God. And let me tell you, there's a difference between doing something for God and experiencing the presence of God. And when you walk through dry places, we can have one or two responses. In the dry places and the dry seasons that we walk, we can take advantage of those moments to grow deeper in our faith and our love for Jesus Christ, or we can go inward and die on the inside. 
I took the lesser path. I was out of ministry for about four years and we have family here and we moved from Fort Oglethorpe back to Cartersville. We just kind of started attending here. I didn't want anybody to know me. I don't want anybody to know anything about me. We just came in here and, and started holding doors and, and serving and got me a, oh, I thought it was really important. I got a lanyard. <laughs> you know? If you got a lanyard in the room, praise God for you, man. That's where, I mean, I just want into you to hold a door and, and walk people to their seat. And, and I had this crazy idea of getting a little broom and a dustpan between gatherings. And, and I was sweeping up, you know, papers in the floor. And I could always tell if it was a great sermon by Pastor James because there were like fingernails all over the floor. <laughs> people are biting their fingernails because they're really nervous about the sermon and toss them in the floor. And you say, Pastor, that's gross. And I'm like, yes, that's why I swept those up. I didn't want the next gathering to see what happened at the previous gathering. So sweep those bad boys up. But I know that everybody in this room has walked through dark places. All of us have. Uh, you're human. If you haven't, you're lying. Because we've all walked through dark places. I mean, we live in a COVID world. Every one of us has been touched by someone that's been affected by COVID or has passed away or someone that's died of cancer or, or all those prayer requests that were up here on the wall a while ago. We've all walked through dark places. And when we look at the Hebrews, what they were doing they were, had been in Judaism, they discovered Jesus, received Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, but yet when the going got tough and they were dispersed and they were separated and there was persecution that was taking place throughout the land, they withdrew from God. They kind of went back to things that they knew. And I think we do the same thing. Whenever we go through dry places, a lot of us, instead of reaching back to Jesus, because we feel like somehow or another he's just not involved, we have a tendency to go back to things that were familiar to us in our past. And for some of us, it's addiction. For some of us, it's, it's terrible decisions in relationships. For some, it's just quitting on everything. And the Hebrews did the same thing. They kind of went back to what they thought they knew and, and, they, and they had, you know, trusting in angels and Pastor James talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And so let's look at our text for today. Hebrews chapter two, beginning in verse number five. It'll be on the screen if you don't have a device or a Bible. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. And it's been testified somewhere, and this is, of course, Psalm, Psalm uh, chapter eight. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present... We do not yet see everything in subjection to him. Can I get an amen? The world is crazy right now. And it's not under the subjection of Jesus Christ, but listen, his kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom of God is in me and you, right? Verse nine, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation I will sing of your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. Can't wait to that day. And deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect 
so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now, there again, he's writing to a group of people that feel ostracized. He's writing to a a group of people that are walking through dark places. And one good thing that the writer does, he wants to call back into remembrance where they come from. He wants to call them back into remembrance. You see, the thing of of it was, in their struggle, in them walking in dark places, they had forgotten where they came from. And in a Jewish culture, Hebrew culture, their lineage is important, their history is important, and this writer being very familiar with that took them back to that as well. And it brings us to our first idea this morning. You can write this down. Man, not angels, were given dominion over the earth. Man, not angels, were given dominion over the earth. You see, when God spoke to Adam and Eve, he spoke to Adam and he said, Adam, I want you to own this garden. Man, I want you to work it. I want you to love it. I want you to prune it. I want you to enjoy all that the garden has. I want you to subdue it. So there was a message even to the Hebrews that early on, the message to the first two people was subdue the earth. So it's always nice to be reminded of those things. You see, he was a, God had a perfect creation with a perfect couple. God had made this perfect creation and put this perfect couple in it. Now, I remember when I first got married, I felt like that me and Lisa were the perfect couple. And it didn't take very long for my wife to realize that I wasn't the perfect husband. Amen? You don't have to amen that loud. You don't know me, man. And it, and it didn't take me long for, I to, for me to discover that, you know what, she's not the perfect wife either. I mean, all of us have faults and all of us have things that we do. I mean, is it a big deal to leave the cap off the toothpaste? Absolutely, it's a big deal. It can dry up. Germs can walk up in there. Put the cap, amen, put the cap on that thing. Put that thing in the drawer. What's your problem? You can tell who I am in the relationship. But God created this perfect couple. He put them in this perfect creation. And he said, I just want you to subdue it. And it's amazing the things that they saw. You see, he was a present God with a present people. God was present with Adam and Eve. He walked with them in the cool of the day. Can you imagine what they saw for the very first time? I I mean, I, I have this huge imagination. I know, I'm 54 years old and I still think like a little kid does. I have this huge imagination that can you imagine walking through the Garden of Eden for the very first time and a butterfly fly by? You know, or an animal like a duckbill platypus walk by. You think, is that normal? Yeah. I mean, God, are you finished with that? Because it's got a duckbill, it's got, the, you know what I'm talking about. And, and they got to experience lions and tigers and bears Oh my. I mean, it was like being in the cage in the zoo with the animals that were all afraid to be around because it was a perfect creation. There was no death that had taken place yet. There was no sin that, has, that was involved yet. And so, you know, lions didn't chase after zebras and zebras didn't chase after whatever zebras chase after. I don't really know what they do. It's just a perfect place in a perfect state with a perfect couple, because the cool thing was God created man as a triune being, his body, soul, and spirit. And he got to observe the intimacy that Adam and Eve got to have. So you got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, who had experienced intimacy for all of eternity. Once creation was made with Adam and Eve, then they got to observe intimacy within man. That's pretty cool. And I think God loves it whenever we experience that intimacy as well. The problem was, it was was the perfect storm for a prideful heart. 
It was a perfect storm for a prideful heart. When things are going great for us, when we are walking through seasons where everything is going well, how deep is our prayer life? You know, when I'm walking through seasons and, and man, things are going great and everybody's healthy and everybody's wealthy and everybody's wise and we're walking through those seasons, my prayer life is, God, thank you that I'm not like other people, right? <laughs> so, sounds a little prideful there, doesn't it? And so, but I can tell you that the times that I'm in the deepest prayer with, with God, I'm, there's been times in my life where I've been found in the fetal position on the ground crying out to God from the fetal position because my heart was so heavy and dry. So if you have a prideful heart, you tend to think that, that your way is best, right? And, and no matter what God thinks, my way is best. And God put that tree there in the garden, the knowledge of good and evil, and Eve walked by it and listened to a snake. And number one, if a snake talks to you, do not talk back. I mean, come on, everybody knows that, right? You know, and they engaged it. And because of they engaged Satan in the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they gave themselves over because of a, a prideful heart. So when the writer of Hebrews is writing to these estranged Christians that were Jews, he's reminding them, listen, even Adam and Eve in a perfect state, in a perfect condition that walked with God every day in the cool of the day, they still got it wrong. They didn't, they didn't last either. Nobody knows how long Adam and Eve lasted in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. All we know is there was a point in time that they just rejected what God said and listened to the enemy who said, listen, God is holding out on you. There are things that God knows that you don't know and if you knew those things, you would be as smart as God. And they felt like God was holding out. Well, when you're going through dark places in your life and you're walking through seasons of dryness, you need to know that you haven't been the only one that has walked through dry places. You're not the only one that's had seasons of distrust. Even the perfect couple in the perfect creation still messed it up. And you're gonna mess it up too. I'm gonna mess it up too. It's just gonna happen that way. And it's sad that we're not more trusting of God in it. And to me, it's amazing that it was a fallen angel that was in that tree of the knowledge of good and evil that convinced them to do wrong. And now they're trusting in angels, thinking that somehow another angel's gonna lead them. It's almost like the same lie they heard the first time, they're believing it again the second time. It's kind of like being in an abusive relationship and you say, I can't stand this relationship and you leave it and you go to another abusive relationship. Because <laughs> sometimes we just know what we know and knowing what we know is more comfortable than finding a way out. That's why we run back to our addictions. We run back to things. It's like firefighters will tell you that in a fire, whenever somebody yells fire and the fire alarms go off, People have a tendency to run out the door they came in instead of the flashing exit signs all around. Because we go to what's familiar to us. You see, the God they wanted was more dominant than the God who is. The God that they wanted in desolate places was a God that would destroy their enemies. But the God who is is a God that wants to conquer our heart. You see, if, if God can get your heart, your actions will follow God is trying to get our heart. He, the kingdom of God, we, we experience that in a, in a heart way. And when it's in the heart, it, it expresses itself through our actions. I love the next couple of verses there because it's something that just wrecks me every time I read that. In Hebrews 2 verse 6, it says, It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you care for them? Of course, this is a direct quote from Psalm chapter eight. And he's, when you think about it, what is man that God should be mindful of him? I think of Moses when Moses was on the mountain and he was with God and the people had, were worshiping a golden calf and they had turned themselves away from God. 
And God says to Moses, Moses, I can destroy them and I can make a great nation out of you. Man, what a temptation. What a temptation. And Moses says, wait a minute, God. What is Egypt gonna say? That you brought them out in the desert to destroy everybody and ruin your own reputation? Don't do it. You need to save those people. You need to rescue those people. He came an inter intercessor between God and Israel and Moses talked to God about his own people that were disobedient. And you think it would have been easier just to start over. He already did it back in Genesis chapter eight where every thought of man's heart was evil continually and he destroyed the earth with a flood and he saved Noah and his wife and three sons and their wives and all the animals. So remembering back, listen, he was telling these Hebrews, I know where you are, but remember, we've been here before and I can get you out. Trust me, I can get you out. There's about three things from those verses that we see from Hebrews 2, 6 through 8. First is God mindful of me when I'm not mindful of him. I mean, is God really mindful of me? I mean, was, my, was Jesus, did, did Jesus really have me on his mind when he prayed in the garden? God, I'm not praying just for these that you've given me, but I'm praying for all of those in the future that will receive me. As the old song says, when he was on the cross, guess what? We were on his mind. Is he mindful of us? Absolutely, thank God for it. The second thing in those verses we find is God made Jesus lower than the angels. In other words, God made Jesus with the uh, susceptibility to sin. In other words, Jesus was subjected to sin, but yet without sin. Jesus was tempted in every way that we were tempted. So to be made lower than the angels was to put Jesus in a position to where he could suffer temptation. He could suffer pain. I remember in youth group many, many years ago, they challenged us to come back the next week and memorize a verse of scripture. So I went home and memorized John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. See it? Shortest verse in the Bible. I mean, who's gonna go for Psalm 119, right? 150 verses, nobody's going for that. But what I love about those verses is what it says in those verses that Jesus wept, his compassion, his love. He suffered pain just like we suffer pain. He wept and cried because his heart was hurt because his friend had died. Jesus has been touched in every way that we can be touched. Don't think that you're walking through a season that you're all alone and that Jesus knows nothing about that. He knows your pain. He knows where you are. He knows the path that you're walking in and he is mindful of you in those paths. He's not a God that's, that's pulled back and says, you know what, when everything's over, I'll come back and clean this mess up. No, 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 no. He walks in the mess with us. Because guess what? We're a bunch of messy people. Nobody amens that one. <laughs> he made him lower. And also he subjected him to mortality. Not, not just subjected to temptation and, and sin and pain, but he's subjected to mortality. You've got the immortal stepping out of heaven, stepping into flesh, and being susceptible to sickness and disease and death. Jesus was susceptible to those things. When a briar, when he walked through and, and, and a briar poked him, he felt that pain. When his friend died, he felt that pain. He became mortal so that you and I could have immortality. And then last, he put everything in subjection under Christ. He put everything in subjection under him. Listen, the world is not where it needs to be now. But praise God, in the future it will be. That's part of the hope that we get to enjoy. It's the fact that we're, we're not yet now, but we will be one day. I'm not what I want to be now. 
But one day I will be like Christ. That brings us to our second idea. Jesus, not angels, tasted death for all. Jesus, not angels, tasted death for all of us. Jesus did not put an angel in the Garden of Eden. Jesus, they didn't call an angel to come down to walk the earth and take our sin on the cross. It was the Son of God who stepped out of immortality into the mortal so that he would know our pain and know our struggle so that when we walk through desolate places, it's not like he doesn't understand. He does. There's a lot of hurt in our world right now. There's a lot of crazy in our world right now. But can I just tell you that God is mindful of you? And that even though we're walking through seasons of pain and and we're walking through seasons of misunderstandings and, and, and craziness, let me just let you know that when you're walking that path, Jesus is walking with you. These Hebrews needed to know that. They needed needed to know that, that, that God was with them when they were feeling estranged from him. You see, Jesus took on mortal flesh to bring immortality to those of us who believe. Jesus was the pioneer of our salvation. Jesus is the one who will assume responsibility for caring for us. It's not angels. If you're trusting in an angel to come and rescue you, and, I, and listen, we, we know from, from Scripture that angels are ministering spirits. They're to add value to the work of the Holy Spirit. They're to add value to the work of Jesus in us, but never to replace it. There's only one that can save, and that's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's the only one uh, that can save A third idea, Jesus, not angels, sanctifies us. It's Jesus, not angels, that sanctify us. The angels are not what we sing about in the old song we sang as kids where he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, and I won't do the motions on that one. (laughs) But God's still working on me. It's not not angels. He didn't do that for angels. He does that for us. And and sanctification is just a process of us being more like Jesus. So to be, it's a big word, but to be sanctified is, is being made more in the image of Jesus, where the way that I respond to people is more like Christ. The way that I trust and the way that I walk and the way that I I love is more like Jesus. And here's the good thing. Sanctification, it's not your responsibility to become more like Jesus. Adairsville, it's not your responsibility to make yourself more like Jesus. It's his responsibility to make us more like Jesus. And what happens in sanctification and what makes sanctification work is when we're just obedient to the commands of God. When they asked Jesus, they said, which is the greatest commandment? He said, well, we can pretty much bow that down to two. Love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, all your mind. Everything you got, love God. And he said the second is like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. So how are you loving God? How are you loving your neighbor? God is the one that initiates sanctification in us. It is his Holy Spirit that convicts us when we're in a place that we should not be, or we say something that we should not say. He takes the initiative to grow you up to be more like Jesus, but guess what our part is? We obey. We obey. And obey what you know. You're not responsible to obey things that you don't know. You're only responsible to obey the things you know. So just obey in what you know, and guess what? He will grow you. He will sanctify you. He will make you more like Jesus. That brings us to our fourth idea. Let me back up just a second. I want to say something about these verses in verse 12 and 13. I just want to say something really quick about these. 
Because he gives us three Old Testament references. And there again, he's speaking to Hebrews who were familiar with the Old Testament. And he's trying to encourage them. It's kind of like for you and I, we, we all, all of us have kind of our go-to quote, you know, that we use, especially with our kids, right? You know, we have that go-to uh, quote, you know. And, and so this writer of Hebrews had some go-to quotes back from the Old Testament to help the Hebrews understand that he wasn't just talking off the cuff, but he's using what God initially said to encourage them to where they were at this time. And he says, in, in verse 12, and it's a direct reference to Psalm 22. He says, for it was fitting, um, excuse me, uh, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. So he's basically saying, listen, you guys are a band of brothers. Stay together. You're feeling desolate. And the times that you feel most desolate are the times that you need somebody else to walk with you. It's not the time to retreat. They're talking about groups up here earlier. We all need to be in a group, a group of people that, where we can share the one another's and, and have somebody say, look, man, are you okay? It looks like you're not doing really well. Can I, can I help you? Is there something I can do? We need that. We're a band of brothers. That second verse, I will put my trust in him. There's a circle of trust for those of us that are believers. We need to be able to trust somebody that can help you. And that third verse is a, a direct quote from Isaiah. And he says in there, that, that uh, behold, I am the children that God has given me. So we're chosen ones. We've been chosen by God. So we're, in a, we're a band of brothers. We're in a circle of trust and we're chosen by God. And it brings us to our last point. Jesus saves man, not angels. Now, I'm stating the obvious, of course. But it's Jesus. It's not angels that we're depending upon for salvation. It wasn't an angel that went to the cross. It was the Son of God. It was Jesus Christ who stepped out of immortality into the mortal so that he could experience what we have experienced yet without sin, go to a cross, die for our sins so that we could have forgiveness of sins, then to be raised on the third day so that we could have the new life that we can experience in Jesus Christ. No angel did that. And if you're expecting an angel to come and rescue you, guess what? He ain't coming. Jesus has already come. He's already come. And I want to read Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11 and 12, because it talks about in these verses, it says that on the that Jesus became our high priest. And I want to talk about what that means, and then we'll close. Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood and goats and cows, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. So Jesus became a man so that he could become the high priest so that he could sacrifice himself as the sacrificial lamb. Now, that's a heavy statement. Jesus became a man so that he could become our high priest, so he could offer up himself as the sacrificial lamb of God on the cross. He was the only one that was worthy to do that. And it says that he made propitiation for the sins of man. And I'm glad they left that word because that word carries weight with it. And I'll kind of give you the simple definition. But Jesus Christ upon the cross took the penalty of our sin and canceled it so that the anger of God could be averted. Because we're sinners, we deserve the wrath of God. But Jesus took our place, became our high priest, became our sacrificial lamb, and he satisfied the anger of God against sin and gives us eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that is something that we should celebrate. Amen? Because we have this access to the Father because of that. And I want to just kind of recap real quick. Man, not angels were given dominion over the earth. Jesus, not angels, tasted death for all. Jesus, not angels, sanctifies us. And Jesus saves man. It's not angels. 
And I'm going to share with you briefly kind of a, a personal story that hopefully can illustrate what we're talking about and give you some hope because as the title of the sermon today says, Jesus saves. Here's a question for you. How many of you guys have ever been camping? Camping? Now, I'm not talking about one of those 40-foot-long things you put in the back of a truck and, and haul to a campground and where it's, if you've got a 90-inch TV. I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I mean camping. I mean waking up with rain hitting you in the face because the tent that was supposed to be waterproof is not. I, you, listen, I'm feeling you right now. I've been there and done that. Listen, I, I, I really, I don't like camping. Now, we, my, we camped with our kids from the time they're up to 12. They, my oldest daughter was 12 before she ever stayed in a hotel room the very first time. And we stayed in the hotel room with three kids. I told my, I looked at my wife and I said, I'm just gonna buy a tent. We're gonna go camping right now. These kids are driving me crazy in this hotel room. I mean, because we were used to getting a tent site between the bathhouse and the playground, and we just sat in our chairs with the fire going and watched the kids ride their bike and let the entire village take care of our kids. Amen? <laughs> if you've ever been camping, you know what I'm talking about. Because there's always that family when you're camping with, you don't know them. They're from a state 20 states away. And all of a sudden, their kids are playing with your kids' toys. You're like, get away from my kids, man. You know? <laughs> And then one of the reasons I don't like camping is, is because I've camped in Cordell, Georgia, which is the gnat ring, and, and you've got gnats in your nose and your eyes and your ears and your sleeping bag and your clothes and, and your car. There's gnats everywhere. We're finding carcasses of dead gnats months later. That's just gross. So I'm, I'm not, but the only reason I camp is not because I love the outdoors, not because I love the horrible experience. It's because I'm just too cheap to pay for a hotel room. That's the only reason I went camping. And my, my wife loves it, you know. Our favorite place to go was, we love to go down to Pine Mountain, Georgia, Roosevelt State Park, right down next to Callaway Gardens. We camped there a bunch of times. And so, and, and, and of course we had three kids. Our kids were eight, five, and three. Hannah being the oldest, Mary being the middle child. <laughs> Anybody here a middle child? Are you a middle child? Has anything in your life ever been fair? Are there any childhood photos of you? None. None. There, there, no. The only ones that we have of Mary have proof written across it. Because that's the free one you get from the school. You know, when you have a, you have a middle child, you, you know they're there because they whine and cry all the time. But, but you know, it, it, it's difficult. It can be difficult. And, and our Mary, oh my gosh, I love her <laughs> because my, as my wife, as my, actually my grandmother said it, she said, Clay, you spit her right out of your mouth. That sounds gross, don't it? What it means in old person terms is that she's just like me. If you got a kid just like you, it offers both challenges and rewards, right? And so, and, and Mary was our child that nothing was ever fair. And, and, and if, if we were doing anything, she was the first one to get hurt, the first one to cry. I mean, if a bee was gonna sting anybody, it's gonna sting, it's gonna sting Mary. If anybody's hand got caught in the car door after it was shut, it was Mary, you know? You ever done that? You know, you shut the car door, she got her hand there and it shuts, and, and it hurts so bad she can't even cry. And you're like, where's Mary? You look back and she's, you know, doing this whole thing, you know. <laughs> Hurting so bad her mouth is wide open but no noise is coming out. <laughs> she's about to pass out. Oh, she'll, she'll be fine. She'll wake up in a few minutes. Everything be good. So, but she's the one we had to hose her down every time we went somewhere with insect spray because insects loved her, you know. And so, and she was also our child. She was our Disney child. And you know what that means? All the animals talk and they all loved her. Her stuffed animals talked to her and everything loved her. And so it was, it was awesome, you know, because of that. So we go to Callaway Gardens and, and the thing that she's most excited about is the Butterfly Center, the Day Butterfly Center. She says, oh, Daddy, I can't wait to hug the butterflies. They're going to love me. I'm like, yes, Mary Elizabeth, they will love you. They're going to Who doesn't love you, Mary? Mama. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Well, your daddy loves you twice as much, so we're, we're good, right? 
And so we get down there, man, we, you know, we're putting the armor on the kids, you know, the helmets, and, and, and we're securing them into the seats on the back of the bicycles. And, and Hannah's eight. She's got a little holly hobby bike. She's going to go the full seven miles. And so, so we start, and, you know, of course, the Day Butterfly Center is like stop number nine, right? And so, so every way, Daddy, is this the Butterfly Center? No, baby, it's seven more stops. Daddy, is this the baby? No, it's six more stops. Daddy, oh, please, don't say another word, Okay. You ask me again, we're not going, right? We always say that as parents. <laughs> and so we finally get there and she gets out and she don't even want to take her helmet off. She's running up to the butterfly center. You know, we come on, baby, let's get the helmet off, you know. And so we walk in and the, the wind about blows you back because they're trying to keep the butterflies on the inside. And it's supposed to be 10,000 butterflies. I mean, butterflies from all over the world. And Mary is so excited, she can't stand herself. We get inside and we're walking around and it's really kind of creepy because they're landing on you and you're like, this could be a poisonous butterfly. You, you know, you <laughs> kind of think those thoughts and some of them are like big. I mean, they're like four foot wingspan butterfly, you know, <laughs> coming on you, landing on you and, and little ones and big ones. And so, and I, and I hear from behind, I hear this faint cry of, of Mary crying. And I'm like, why? Why is Mary crying? And I mean, we're in the place, in her happy place. She's going to hug all the butterflies, right? She's going to name them all, and we're all going to take them home with us. And so I look back, and, and, and Mary says, Daddy, none of the butterflies like me. None of them like me. And I'm like, baby, that's not true. Nobody doesn't like you but, but Mom. Um, but um, so I'm like trying to catch butterflies, right? Security's got their eye on me. So I'm over here because, listen, a butterfly is going to like my daughter. I mean, it's going to happen. I'm going into full-on dad mode, buddy. So I'm like, you know, catching butterflies and I put them on her hand. Woo, that thing flies away. What in the world? And so I catch another one, put it in fly. Oh, just validated her fears that none of the butterflies like her. So, you know, in tears, we walk out, we leave. We're suiting up in the armor to get back on the bicycles. And a thought hit my brain. We have put insect spray all over her. She's the only kid we hose down, you know, with the insect spray. And so Lisa takes her in the bathroom and we take towels and try to wipe it off. But no, 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 it's not the spray kind. We put the lotion kind on her <laughs> that makes you white for like 30 minutes before it absor absorbs into your skin. I'm sure there's long-term repercussions. But anyways, it's uh, so it was just sad, you know. She looks so forward to being in the Day Butterfly Center and having the butterflies love on her and they didn't do it because she had insect repellent all over her. Can I just say this about some of us? There's some of us in the room that we are dying for intimacy. We're dying for love. We are dying for forgiveness. But we feel like that there's something on us that just prevents God from getting through to our heart. You're walking in places and you've got this death on you and you've got this sin on you and you feel like I can't have intimacy and I can't have this, this forgiveness of, of my sins. But can I tell you that we serve a God in heaven that is able to cleanse you of your sins, that's able to move into your heart and move into your life and give you the intimacy that you've always longed for. It's available to you because Jesus saves. You may have walked in here today and you've been walking through desolate places and your heart is dry and your life is dry and you feel like you have no meaning and you feel like you've got something all over you preventing this intimacy that you long for. Can I tell you that Jesus is here today and he wants to extend that intimacy out to you through forgiveness of sin, through receiving Jesus Christ and having this awesome relationship with the Father in heaven. He extends out to you. Adairsville, He extends out to you. If you're walking through dark places, if you're watching online, if you're walking through dark places, He loves you and He cares for you. He's done all of this for you. It's not an angel that's going to save you. It will only be Jesus. And the Bible gives us the way to do that. You see, I just need to agree with God that, that I'm a sinner and that I need Jesus. I need to believe. 
I need to believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and then I need to be able to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. If you're here and you have never taken that step of faith to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to do that today, right now. Because there's a God in heaven that has prepared the way for you. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You don't get to God unless you come through me. And if you're walking through desolate places in the balcony, and if you're walking in dark places and you need some light, we serve a God in heaven that offers that to you today. Will you receive him? We're not inviting you into a religious organization. We're inviting you into a relationship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ, the Son, who is seated at the right hand of God right now praying for you. He's done all that He can do to bring you into a relationship with Him. He extends that invitation to you to say, will you, will you receive it? That's the invitation. We're gonna pray and I'm gonna encourage you if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that today be the day you pray a prayer of faith and you trust Jesus Christ for his salvation. He wants to extend that to you. He's done everything he can to extend that to you. The Holy Spirit is present in this room and he wants to guide you through that. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, today is the day of salvation. God, you have not given us another way. There's only one way, and that is through Jesus Christ. And if we're walking around and we feel like we've got something all over us that's keeping us from intimacy, from love, from forgiveness, Lord, I pray today if you're in this room or if you're watching online or if you're at our Daresville location, you can pray a simple prayer and say, Jesus, I admit today, I know I'm a sinner. Everybody knows I'm a sinner. Everybody that knows me knows that I'm a sinner. I believe that you can forgive me of my sins. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and I confess right now that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Would you pray that simple prayer of faith? Allow God to make you into a new creation. Father, I pray as people have prayed around this room, that have prayed online, that have prayed in Adairsville, God, to ask Jesus to come in their life, to save them. I pray that they'll be bold enough to take the next step to let somebody know about it. Come and talk to a prayer team member. Text us online and let us know that they've trusted Jesus. Come to one of us and let us know that they've made that decision to trust Jesus. God, we love you so much. Thank you that you're mindful of us, that you walk through dark places with us and you never leave us or forsake us. We love you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.